if I were to use an analogy here, we essentially like the Titanic, but instead of the, uh, the captain of the Titanic at the time not seeing the iceberg because it was dark, we can see the iceberg here in this particular situation. We can actually do something to turn the ship around, but it is simply too much for the ANC to do so. so Hello and welcome back to Solutions with David and Sara. I've had a good break, but it's really great to be resuming the podcast again. To kick off the show for 2022, we're going to be looking at the economic headwinds facing the South African economy. I thought the perfect person to bring in to discuss this theme is Becky Matlobo. He is my colleague at the Center for Risk Analysis. He is a senior analyst with us there and somebody who has some great insights into the economy both domestically and globally. Becky Matlobo, welcome to Solutions with David Ansar. Hi, David. Uh, thanks for having me on. It's about time I appeared on your show. I've been watching a few of your videos. I'm glad that you called me on. Yeah, I'm very glad that I called you on too. It is, I, I agree, long overdue. So Becky, I think many viewers, particularly of the CRA channel, will be quite familiar with you. you many of your videos have appeared on the channel, but Maybe people don't uh, know too much about your background, and I thought this would be a good opportunity uh, for us to explore how you got interested in economics and how it is that you came to this point in your career. Yeah, so my interest in economics there, David, came from the uh, deep uh, longing to understand how this world works. And I believe that through economics, it could give a lot of answers to the question that I had, particularly from a very young age and well. Um, you know, a, a point in which I started to ask myself these questions was during the financial crisis where I saw essentially the global world essentially melting and I asked what was the causes that led to where the world was heading at that point. Uh, and in its, simplicity, in its simplest terms, economics is essentially the study of human exchange. You have something of value that you'd like to exchange, and I have something to, of value that you'd like and, you, and I would like to exchange to you, and then we exchange, then we move to a higher level of satisfaction. Uh, now, uh, once we continue with that, in other words, trade with each other, we end up with a higher level of satisfaction. Now, unfortunately, it often comes that there are countless of examples where actors come between us, and unfortunately, that results in unintended consequences and unfortunately a decline in most cases in living standards for a lot of people around the world. So yeah, that's where my interest for economics came about as to I wanted to understand what are the consequences of uh, policy actions enacted by governments around the world and policy is quite uh, correlated with economic output uh, with any given country as well as uh, the way of thinking which a government uh, follows. Now, oh, Becky, I was reading earlier today, Open by Johan Norberg, which was a book that was recommended to me by an earlier guest, Chris Hatting. And what really struck me about that was that early Homo sapiens, so going all the way back to the Neolithic era, is archaeological evidence of them trading and exchanging with one another. And economic activity is not just a modern phenomenon, it's something inherent in human nature. Uh, so I think understanding economic forces it's a really good way of understanding human behavior more broadly. Yeah, exactly, David. And uh, it's one of the key uh, components of prosperity around the world, you know, uh, trading with each other. You know, I, for example, am deeply focused in, in economics. Therefore, I sell my labor uh, specializing in, in the economics field, whereas someone else could be specialized in, for example, political analysis as well. And, and so therefore, they, they specialize in that field and then we exchange ideas. Uh, through labor in this instance. Or it could be in the form of entrepreneurship where an uh, individual starts a restaurant and sells food to in, uh, people that would like to purchase, for example, chicken at an affordable prices. Uh, so this has one, one been one of the key components of prosperity around the world uh, when it comes to trade, free trade, in, in fact, and uh, actually understanding um, economics uh, you would actually also understand policies that are bad and detrimental to that prosperity. Right. Well, Becky, uh, you are a lot younger than I am. And so most of your adult life and your teenage years have been spent in the wake of the global financial crisis, as you said, uh, which has really ushered in a period of uh, unprecedented economic activity in the, in the form of state intervention, 
particularly in terms of monetary policy, since the crisis, there's been very high levels of fiscal and monetary stimulus, uh, which has buoyed asset markets and uh, artificially inflated asset prices. Uh, what are some of your reflections on where the global economy is at? And then later, perhaps we can talk more about South Africa. Now, unfortunately, the uh, global environment's not looking quite rosy there, David. Over the past two years, there's been an increase in the quantum of stimulus a lot of uh, these developed uh, uh, countries. Uh, for example, if you look at what's happening in the US, uh, there's been an increase in terms of stimulus printed, dollars printed as a proportion of GDP. And the result of that is high inflation numbers. In fact, as it currently stands, uh, the United States is facing near 40 levels high uh, uh, inflation levels. And the consequences of that, unfortunately, pinches consumers in the US. Uh, an example that came from last week there, David, is looking at the what the Biden administration is saying with meatpacking industries, where it's sort of shifting the blame off, off inflation, which is caused by money printing on meatpacking industries, saying that they're charging way too much uh, on consumers. Uh, the unfortunate um, policy tool that often governments try to do to hide the inflation is price controls. Uh, this is something that I don't uh, will see in some countries, for example, and it's something that has been hinted by the Biden administration, uh, uh, we might see. Um, now, the, the response to these high inflation le levels is uh, tapering, which in other words is the reduction of purchasing of government bonds by the central bank in the US, as well as other central banks around the world, as well as increasing interest rates uh, in these countries. That has major implications uh, in terms of that there will be less money circulating around the world, less money circulating in emerging markets like South Africa, which has great uh, implications, which is something we can discuss as we uh, go along. Yeah, and many of the people who have long been advocating for these very high levels of monetary stimulus uh, are adherents of modern monetary theory, uh, which basically tries to suspend or, or bend the laws of, of monetary economics and to suggest that there won't be inflationary effects, which is what they've been arguing for many years. But now we're seeing uh, this record high inflation, as you said, uh, higher, highest that it's been in about 40 years. Also, the massive le levels of inequalities that's occurring with people that actually own uh, assets that are related with inflation, like property, for example, as well as stock markets, compared to nominal GDP uh, in the US. In fact, we have a graph there, David, where you can actually see household uh, wealth uh, comparing that to nominal GDP each and every year. And that gap is getting wider and wider and wider. And the consequence of that, unfortunately, there, David, is that it then fuels uh, the flames of uh, policies or way of thinking such as critical race theory. Uh, in which individuals will then uh, feel that uh, they are deprived of economic op opportunity, then would strive to then um, um, uh, follow these policies, uh, which are detrimental, unfortunately, to economies. Yeah, and you mentioned price controls, and there's a very long history of countries implementing price controls with disastrous effects, uh, which uh, you know creates supply shortages, uh, black markets, etc. Um, and yeah. you mentioned. Uh, that you know, there has been commentary from some of these MMT theorists, uh, one of whom is uh, Mariana Mazzucato, who is actually an advisor on President Sol Ramaphosa's uh, economic council. So, uh, you know, in terms of the court economists, the official economists, um, you know, they actually have uh, the ear of politicians, which I think is uh, very concerning and a potential threat, I would say. Uh, it is. It definitely is. Uh, price control should never be something that is considered by the South African government. Unfortunately, uh, we may uh, see that looking at the way of thinking by the South African government. And the inevitable end point of price controls is that the industries which are then regulated, unfortunately, end up being uh, nationalized. As when, you nat as you, when you set a price control, you are then cutting out suppliers and they, uh, as they cannot sell, for example, meat for a, profitable, for a profitable price. So then they then stop investing in meat. Therefore, the government needs to then regulate factors that go into the production of meat, which are ne inevitably leads to more control and more intervention by the uh, government involved. Unfortunately, the outcome there is then you end up in a worse situation than you were previously 
uh, where consumers, unfortunately, are the ones that pay the price, uh, either through by way of uh, lesser quality in terms of that meat, higher prices if they're searching it from the black markets. So, Becky, you mentioned the role of the state and some of the hazards and secondary effects of the state intervening in the economy, disrupting market signals, disrupting the kind of free exchange of goods and services uh, between individuals and organizations. So what, in your view, ought to be the role of the state? What is the appropriate role for the state to be playing in a market economy? Uh, in the market economy, David, the role of the state should just be maintaining the law and order. In other words, if uh, I, for example, um, cause you harm or I burn your property, then it should be the state that handles law and order in a market economy. The, the, the government should have minimum uh, interference with market interactions as the consequences are quite dire. Um, the prices, unfortunately, the ones that actually pay are the ones that are often not seen. And that is why we get more and more government intervention as the years progress. Uh, so to answer your question, the role of the government is to therefore maintain law and order and to make sure that they are minimally involved in market forces. Okay, well, in Economics 101 courses, one of the concepts that comes up is this idea of negative externalities, that as a function of market activity, there are perhaps going to be uh, indirect consequences. So, for example, if there's a factory that is making chemicals and it's spewing pollutants into a river, that's going to create a negative externality for others who wish to, to use the river uh, for the supply of water. Um, so it might be to that chemical factory's advantage to be doing that because they can lower the costs of uh, removing waste, but that ends up harming everyone. So do you think that the state should play a role in reducing negative externalities like that? There is definitely um, a case for government getting involved in terms of uh, if a factory does unfortunately cause harm within a community. Uh, but however, what often occurs is that if that company, for example, in which you made, let's say, the manufacturing um, corn, for example, or tin beans, and unfortunately they pollute in the neighboring communities, uh, those community members would then uh, start to report to the company or buy from a competitor that is less pollutant, and that will inevitably lead with that company that's polluting to lose money. Uh, that's how essentially market forces are at play here. Um, however, there is a case in which uh, if companies are therefore intentionally, as they are cases of this, polluting uh, in communities, environments, and so forth, then the state can, for example, intervene. Yeah, and often what ends up happening is you have so-called NIMBYs, not in my backyard, uh, groups that often have disproportionate power to uh, lobby the government to preserve and maintain their special interests. And they'll often use the argument of the public good and these negative externality concerns that I just raised uh, in order to advance their own specific narrow sectional agenda. Now, that is unfortunate. There are like examples of that, uh, where a small group of individuals then lobby governments at the expense of a larger proportion of society. So I do think that it is a balance, uh, in, in, unfortunately, where uh, companies in which they do harm to communities need to be held accountable, uh, and therefore the state for the, for the state should hold lim uh, limited interference in market forces. Right, Becky. Well, this is a South African podcast. Most of our listeners are South African, and many of them might be wondering, well, how does this all apply to the South African context? Uh, so South Africa is a small open economy. It's very vulnerable to some of the uh, vicissitudes and changes in the global economy. Um, so if a country like the US or China has some kind of recession or boom, uh, we uh, benefit or lose out because of that. Um, but what about our own policy framework, the business environment? Uh, how does that uh, contribute to some of the more negative consequences that we're seeing in terms of low growth, lack of investment in South Africa's economy? What are your thoughts on where the SA economy is at the moment? Fortunately, David, over the past decades, uh, this, uh, the country has been following hostile policies. Uh, for example, expropriation of property by compensation, stringent labor policies, as well as the time and investment levels, as well as that of electricity generation, which is needed for a growing economy. 
Uh, if you look at economic indicators such as GDP per capita, current GDP per capita levels are lower than what they were in 2007 when Thabo Mbeki left office. That has resulted in an increase in violent protest action in the country, uh, in, the, in the regions of 400% over the past 10 years. And unfortunately there, David, is that it was not always like this. From the period 1994 until 2007, the country experienced high levels of economic growth. We doubled employment levels and between 2004 and 2007, the country was growing at levels of about three to 5%, which was uh, the same level seen in other emerging markets. The difference between that period, David, as well as the period that we're currently seeing is that there's been a change of way with, of thinking within the national government. Uh, that was the years of Nelson Mandela as well as Thabo Mbeki, which they uh, inevitably led in, through their policies such as that of GIA, led to the increase of economic activity in the country. Subsequent to that period, we've had more of a redistributive government under Jacob Zuma as well as now that of Cyril Ramaphosa, where we have policies such as BEE that have been detrimental to the South African economy and resulted in stagnant levels. Uh, Further uh, evidence of this is when you look at income levels, which have been in the zero level, which means there's been no substantial growth in income levels in the country. Uh, when you look at living standards, for example, such as employment numbers, uh, in third quarter of 2019, there were about 16 million South Africans employed. Uh, now, currently, in the latest number, employment numbers, there's only about 14 million people employed. That's a decline of 2 million. And David, uh, we just came from the festive season. I imagine when you have such a large proportion of South Africans that have no income, they can't sustain themselves and they can't uh, enjoy their festive season with their families and can't spend, for example, uh, during the festive season. That also negatively impacts retail, which leads to a decline in business confidence levels, which have not been uh, recovered since they peaked during the years of 2007. So, Becky, your family originally hails from the Eastern Cape. Many of your family members are still still there. Did you go back uh, to the Eastern Cape in the festive season? Uh, unfortunately, I did not this time around. Uh, I was just finishing up some research paper for another American think tank, but um, and unfortunately, I was by myself here in Johannesburg. My family, my mother, um, my cousins did leave to go to the Eastern Cape. That is home. I do plan to leave during the Easter holidays. Um, it always just sucks when I'm not there during Christmas, spending time with family uh, and friends. But uh, I do hope that a lot of people, a lot of South Africans did have uh, that, um, uh, did spend time with their family members. Unfortunately, that was not me this time around. <laughs> All right. Well, the Eastern Cape, unfortunately, is one of the poorest provinces in South Africa. And yes. the last time you were there, I mean, were some of these economic challenges uh, starting to make themselves visible. Uh, what are some of your observations about that part of South Africa in particular? What, what are you observing? Most definitely, David. Uh, such things such as basic service delivery. Uh, good luck if you go into the Eastern Cape and you have driving a small car, you need a bucky <laughs> when you're driving through the roads. Uh, otherwise, you, uh, your tires will be uh, messed up. Uh, yeah, so such things such as the service delivery is non-existent in certain parts of the Eastern Cape, unfortunately. Taps run dry, particularly in my village, for example, which I've essentially, that's my home over the past 23 years. Uh, there's no constant water flow, so therefore uh, residents in that village, El Papas, they need to find boreholes in order to get their water from. If, if the boreholes run dry, if it hasn't rained, for example, the nearest town is about 40 minutes away if you have a car, 40 minutes, because it's supposed to take about 15 minutes, but it takes around 40 minutes due to the gravel road and you have to travel so, uh, slowly so that you don't damage your car. So those are the type of issues that people there face, for example, as well as the fact that there's no opportunity, for example, in terms of employment. Uh, if you look at absorption levels in the Eastern Cape, they're, they're close to 20%. The national average is about 40%, in emerging markets about 60%. So unfortunately, there's been a great decline in, in opportunity for people that live in the Eastern Cape. And a large proportion of those people have been without employment for over a year now. Uh, some of them do get the income from form of seasonal uh, farming. However, about three years before the pandemic, there was drought. So you also face with that risk where it doesn't rain all the time and where there's no harvest season during uh, the June uh, uh, season. So, Becky, we're recording this episode in January, and next month will be the finance minister, Enoch Gorangwana's inaugural 
maiden budget speech. Uh, this is an important event in the national calendar, both in terms of economics, but also politically as well. What are some of your expectations for that speech? And uh, what are your impressions of Minister Godongwana? Because he only was appointed to cabinet in August, um, but it seems to have been rather quiet, actually. Uh, what are some of the things that you're anticipating from that speech? Looking at the caliber in which Sir Ramaphosa had to choose uh, for a finance minister, uh, Eno Konagwana does make the most sense if you look at other ministers. However, uh, his performance from, uh, from my perspective has been lackluster. Uh, as you recall, during the medium statement, uh, this is a point in which a week later, the ANC is below 50%, the first time since 1994, the ANC has dipped below that level. Uh, this is a point in which Eno Konagwana should have been uh, strong on reforms that have led the country to uh, see high levels of standard of living in the country, high GDP performance, yeah, increase in, in employment numbers, touching on labor regulations that the country is facing, touching on investment levels that have massively declined over the last 10 years. And unfortunately, uh, he fitted it around the edges, uh, speaking of course, such things as business uh, red tape, which is of course much needed. Uh, there needs to be a decline in red tape that businesses face on a daily basis. However, it did not touch substantially on such things as electricity generation, where there's been a decline massively of electricity generation in the country, where in 2011 was sitting around 80% to its current levels of 61%, and breakdowns have massively increased from about 6% in 2011 to where they currently are at 26%. So there's that, that there, David, caps GDP performance of the country at 1%, which is what we saw in his numbers during his medium term statement. And that number there, David, that's the lowest number ever put by a financial minister on paper since 2005. That tells us that they are simply unwilling to implement the necessary reforms that would see the country emulate what we see in other emerging markets. So therefore, in his, in his uh, February budget speech, I do not expect him to change course. In fact, I do see that the country following the unfortunate trajectory that we're heading towards to. You know, uh, if I were to use an analogy here, we essentially like the Titanic, but instead of the, uh, the captain of the Titanic at the time not seeing the iceberg because it was dark, we can see the iceberg here in this particular situation. We can actually do something to turn the ship around but it is simply too much for the ANC to do so, simply because of the ideology that they, that they follow. Yeah, and in many ways, that Titanic example is a good one because what happened there was they did turn the ship, but too late. And actually that glancing blow was much more devastating than a direct head-on conflict would have been. Uh, they, the ship would have actually stayed afloat had that happened because the uh, airtight doors would have kept the, the ship from sinking. Um, so in some ways, a delayed partial reaction is worse than a upfront uh, disaster. Um, so Becky, I mean, let's just staying with the budget for a moment. Uh, what about the fiscal position in terms of government's public finances? Uh, because you know, for many years now, we've been warning that government expenditure has been ballooning, revenue just uh, is, is, is not keeping pace. However, we did see this commodities boom, this uh, kind of mini super cycle, if you will, uh, artificially inflating uh, some of the government coffers. Um, and then subsequently, all sorts of discussions around basic income grant. And uh, my view of, of this is that we need to be saving for a rainy day um, and taking advantage of this short-term uh, uptick in the cycle. Uh, what are some of your thoughts on revenue and expenditure in SA at the moment? Yeah, so uh, in terms of government revenue as a proportion of GDP, that's projected to be about 36% and then slowly climb down in the next four years. That's, that has been revised downward due to GDP rebasing last year by stats and say. Uh, the government revenue is projected to be much lower than that at 26% and then averaging that level for the next four years which leads to a budget deficit of about 8%. That's about seven times greater than the uh, real GDP growth of South Africa when low base effects are taken into account. That's utterly insane, David. That's not seen in other emerging markets. And the result of that is that you have an increase in debt levels as that deficit 
would need to be financed. And we finance that deficit by borrowing, uh, which, uh, which comes from borrowing from other investors in other foreign countries as well. So the unfortunate thing in terms of the fiscus, it's that it's not looking good. And we spoke about economics here, David, we started this uh, conversation by speaking about economics and what are the policies that lead to actually growth. And with high debt levels, debt levels act as an anchor on economic growth levels in the country in the form of increasing in taxation in the future, as well as that of increasing inflationary threats um, in South Africa, be it through money printing or be it through a way of prescribed assets. Now, the consequence of having such high debt levels as well there, David, is that the cost of servicing that debt also increases where debt servicing costs now are sitting at 353 billion. That's more than what we spend on healthcare, defense, and maintaining and maintenance of law and order in the country. That's that number is slowly approaching what to the most uh, to the second most expensive line item in the budget, and that is that of education. Unfortunately, that sucks away from more important uh, things that I've mentioned earlier. Now, getting back to the commodity uh, price there, uh, David, is that now we're entering a period in which much of central banks around the world are talking about tapering, they're talking about increasing interest rates. And I've mentioned earlier there that there will be less money circulating and sloshing around the world, less money going to emerging markets like that of South Africa, which would lead to debt servicing costs to increase dramatically uh, if you look at government bond yields, uh, the 10 year bond yield, making it more expensive for the for the South African government to service its debt. Yeah, and uh, I think one of the concerns that you raised there, Becky, is that increasingly just paying back the principal and the interest on our debt is going to take on an ever greater proportion of government budget. That's money that could be spent elsewhere on more uh, more high value uh, activities like infrastructure or, or basic services. Um, but I also think the low interest rate environment that we spoke about earlier that has characterized the globe for the last decade has, has meant that there's a lot of money searching yield uh, in the developed world. Um, they're looking for perhaps more risky emerging markets where they're willing to, to, to tolerate uh, less uh, stable economic conditions in, in exchange for, for higher returns on, on government bonds, for example. Um, but that all might change uh, if we see tapering coming in from the US Federal Reserve uh, or the ECB or other places, we might see a rush of capital out of emerging markets back into uh, developed markets. Exactly, exactly there, David. Uh, what we have seen due to lower interest rates that that money has been uh, entering emerging markets due to emerging markets having higher yield compared to the developed world. Take for South Africa, for example, our yields are close to 10%, whereas the US is close to about 1%. Germany is at negative. If you were to buy a government bond from Germany, you would need to actually pay them uh, for holding their debt, <laughs> which is absolutely insane. Uh, so Unfortunately, with lower interest rates there, David, it leads to a, a bubbles in asset prices, for example, like we're seeing now with housing. Not only that, but as well as what we're seeing with other uh, asset, uh, asset classes, if you look at NFTs, for example, literally someone in the United States could literally take a picture now and digitally mash it up and sell it for about millions and millions of dollars. Um, I, I do not, I'm not particularly um, talking against NFTs. I do think that there is a way in which people could raise funds for the avenues that they are uh, pursuing, such as artists in the end of years. But it's gotten to a point where now we're now seeing an increase in, uh, in, in, asset, bubble, in asset bubbles in the end of years, which unfortunately could be a, a, a further uh, example of what we saw during the financial crisis. So Becky, uh, we've also seen the rise of cryptocurrencies as a alternative store of value. Uh, many people like yourself have, have noted and cautioned and warned against uh, some of the excessive risks uh, that might be characterizing this period of, of, uh, of monetary stimulus. Um, how do you think these cryptocurrencies are going to perform long term? Do you think that that's just a fad, or do you think it, we're seeing the emergence of a more decentralized uh, currency system that could help to, to de-risk some of the uh, 
problems that we've spoken about. Yeah, there's a, there's enormous amounts of potential uh, with cryptocurrencies, and essentially, a lot of people tend to dismiss cryptocurrencies as that as that it's it does not have any value because it's not backed by government. But if you look at the history of money, they David, money uh, came into being through market interactions, and then it was stated by governments uh, as legal tender in certain countries. But the initiation of money, the startup process of money, was determined by uh, individuals, let's say in a particular community, determining what should be used as money. Those monies were, to, uh, were, were chosen for, as form of hard money. In other words, money that does not lose value over time, money that's easy to transact. So there's been a lot of items that's been used as forms of money throughout, his, throughout human history, such as rice stones, glass beetles in uh, uh, Western Africa and so forth. And what we're seeing with cryptocurrencies there, David, is a new form of money forming within the marketplace as a form of rejection uh, towards the traditional central banking, where, uh, for example, select individuals would have um, a monopoly on the printing of uh, money and currency in, 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 the, in the US economy or in other economy around the world. Now, my perspective on particular Bitcoin is that on the long term, I do see Bitcoin rising in the future. There are, of course, other cryptocurrencies, which I have not personally invested a lot of my time on as I'm heavily involved in other avenues. So I can only particularly focus on the hardest asset that I do believe will appreciate in the future, and that is that of Bitcoin. The interesting thing with Bitcoin is that it acts as a form of hedge uh, towards inflation. Yeah, we spoke about the United States inflation levels reaching a 40 year high, which is about 68%, 7% in fact, which is massive. Um, South Africa's inflation now is sitting at about 5%, which is above the midpoint mark of 3.5%. If you look at Bitcoin's price, the Bitcoin price has increased by 1000%. This is no way, by the way, of uh, um, telling your audience to invest in Bitcoin, not at all. They should do their own research. But if you look at the uh, time in which uh, Bitcoin started from 2010, where it was literally cents on the dollar and was bought uh, uh, literally for cents, to where it currently is at $41,000 in future, uh, we might see it actually appreciate, which is uh, an inflation hedge. Another thing in a South African context that I'd like to add towards Bitcoin in particular is when you're looking at prescribe uh, expropriation of property with our conversation. As it currently is there, David, I am in the house and if the government uh, passes through an expropriation bill, and they say that they would like to nationalize all land, then my property is at risk. Whereas with Bitcoin, if they do not have my, uh, my private key, then they cannot touch my savings. This is also quite relevant when you're looking at such things such as prescribed assets. All right, Becky. So Bitcoin is one way in which you can hedge yourself against excessive state action. And you mentioned a couple of examples, the expropriation without compensation, prescribed assets, which is essentially uh, the government trying to mandate where asset managers and investors uh, can uh, invest and making them, compelling them to invest in state-owned enterprises, for example, uh, which would potentially lower the returns on those investments, almost certainly would. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that there's a, a general theme here of hostile state action. And, and this is different to, say, meddling bureaucrats, uh, maybe, for example, like what you would see in uh, the EU, where uh, you know uh, officials are a bit kind of over eager to regulate the curvature of a banana or the size of the potato or whatever, this is actually a malevolent state that we're seeing. So not only incapable of providing basic services, as you mentioned with the example of the Eastern Cape, but also actively hostile towards the private sector, towards investment. What are the ideological origins of this, Becky? Because I mean, ultimately policy is downstream from ideology. What, what is the ideological uh, underpinnings of uh, government policy in South Africa today? Unfortunately there, David, is the ideological underpinnings is that of socialism, uh, the National Democratic Revolution, where the main drive is essentially nationalize all institutions in South Africa to be in the holder of that of the state. Now, if I were to essentially provide a small explain, explain of what socialism is. Essentially, it is when the state uh, is in control of the factors of production within the economy, uh, such as that of property, as well as that of allocating resources. Now, if you look at history there, David, there hasn't been any great example in which the state has nationalized a particular industry or has nationalized property 
and has succeeded in terms of allocating resources because the common um, problem that they face, common and it's referred to in the economics referred to as the population problem. Millions of people interacting through exchange and the government is trying to centralize that knowledge into one individual, that one policymaker or a select group of policymakers which lead to market shortages. Now, the unfortunate consequences, unfortunately, is massive levels of food shortages, where we see uh, a number of people facing high levels of poverty. Uh, an example of this is what we see in Zimbabwe, Venezuela, Cuba, and so forth. And uh, that's essentially the ideological opinion of the ANC is that of a socialistic um, leaning. Um, uh, yeah. All right, Becky. So. I think that uh, in terms of our work with the CRA, I mean, you're very involved in the weekly risk alerts. And uh, that's every Monday morning at 7 a.m. for CRA clients. And uh, I'll put a link to uh, the CRA website where listeners can find out more. But I think uh, the most recent risk alert of uh, this past Monday, uh, you and John Andrews, the director of the CRA, uh, you gave some advice on not only the risks in South Africa, but also some of the opportunities uh, which still exist in, in the country, one of which is to fill the gap left by the receding state and to start offering services that would be traditionally associated uh, with the state, like, such as healthcare, uh, security, uh, even we're seeing community groups filling potholes and fixing waterworks and so on. What other opportunities do you see uh, in the year ahead, Beck? Yeah, so if I may touch on the example that you put there where communities are then taking upon themselves to provide basic services. Um, this is just another example that I uh, saw in the Eastern Cape and I'd like to give a shout out. <laughs> um, one of the community members, for example, has a borehole in his uh, property and due to the taps running dry in the Eastern Cape, has taken upon himself to provide water for the uh, community members. Uh, and it, of course, does charge him because he uses electricity to actually pump the water out of the ground and provide it to uh, community members. So those are the opportunities that in which you've listed that they, where community members are then taking upon themselves to provide uh, service delivery. We saw this again in July there, David, in terms of uh, maintaining uh, law and order, for example, such communities in Soweto, for example, as well as other communities in middle class uh, income communities where in, uh, community members have taken upon themselves to protect their property because the police simply couldn't maintain law and order. Um, other opportunities there, David, is when you look at what's how uh, developed countries are treating fossil fuels there, David, by increasing, by limiting uh, uh, the supply of fossil fuels to actually drive up the price of fossil fuels. Uh, we're looking at policies such as ESG, where developed countries are now moving, are trying to move away from fossil fuels and trying to move towards uh, uh, green energy. Unfortunately, green energy is quite expensive compared to fossil fuels. Uh, um, and I've, I've saw a few Germans, uh, a, a German poll essentially saying Germans are quite reluctant to pay a higher price for electricity bills. In fact, ordinary people wouldn't uh, uh, like to pay such high uh, prices. Uh, for basic electricity and so forth. So the opportunity there, David, is in terms of fossil fuels, where we actually start to see fossil prices start to increase. Unfortunately, for the importing, for countries that import fossil fuels, it will negatively impact them. For the countries that actually export fossil fuels, it will actually be a positive outcome. Uh, you could look at, for the example, what's, what Russia is doing by providing national gas towards European countries. That, that's an opportunity for Russia and so forth. And they just drive to so essentially towards scarcity there, David. Well, we've talked so much about government intervention. And unfortunately, we're going to see a lot of things start, uh, start to increase. Uh, prices of certain items start to increase and so forth, which uh, could be a way in which alternative forms of money could then start to appreciate. Yeah, so Becky, I thought that that example of the gentleman who sells his water to be quite an interesting and revealing one because maybe somebody with a more socialist view of the world would look at that and see that as an example of exploitation of uh, natural resources purely for the, the sake of profit. Uh, but I think you know, what your example actually illustrates is that where the state is failing uh, to provide basic necessities, you have private individuals coming in and providing an essential service for people who 
I'm sure um, have limited income, but are happy to allocate uh, that money for this good that they so desperately need. Um, and I think if we had more such enterprising individuals and organizations in the country providing those kinds of services where the state is failing to do so, you could have you could see a reduction of those prices. You could see much more reliability in terms of the provision of those services, better quality service. So, you know, I think the, the, one of the themes of the podcast last year was decentralization, uh, communities and individuals taking some of these initiatives uh, upon themselves. And uh, I think that that's a really good example of that. But now, Becky, I, I think my final question for you would be, if, if you were to be advising a young person emerging out of high school today uh, about studying economics, if they expressed an interest to you in, in uh, what kind of economics they should be reading, uh, how they should be satisfying this interest, what would you, what would you advise them? Um, I'm thinking not only in terms of formal tertiary study, but also just in terms of their own intellectual curiosity for this discipline of economics. Now, the fortunate thing there, David, is that you could learn uh, economic principles for free. Uh, for example, if you look at Mises.org, which they teach sound economics, I would then, if, with that, if that individual approaches me and asks, which, uh, where should I exactly go to get a deep understanding of economics, I'll tell that individual to uh, essentially read up of, on Austrian economics, which I, I believe is the most sound economic school uh, that we currently seeing. Uh, unfortunately, a vast majority of universities are charging expensive prices for, like you mentioned there, David, modern monetary uh, theory, uh, which would lead to disastrous outcomes such as high inflationary, uh, inflationary levels, as well as more government interventions. Um, I would advise that individual to uh, uh, touch on, on, on Mises.org, look at Mises.org, read up on Ludwig von Mises, read up on uh, Lessons in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt, just to get a general understanding of or well, sound economics. And the thing with, it, uh, with, David, with that, David, is that understanding economics is very important. Um, it's very important in terms of understanding bad policy. For example, what the country is now seeing with minimum wages, with a youth unemployment rate of about 80%. When you understand economics, you can then understand that only a select few individuals benefit from minimum wages, but the vast majority of South Africans are barred from employment uh, due to labor prices being set at a higher price. A person that understands the seen as well as the unseen consequences of policies uh, would then be able to advise policymakers on which policies should then be followed. Well, thank you, Maslovo. I'm certainly very grateful for this conversation and I'm glad that you are a member of the CRA team. I will put a link to some of those resources that you mentioned uh, in the show notes. But I just wanted to thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me on, David. Hopefully you have me on again. Absolutely. Before you go, a quick announcement. I have started a personal newsletter. That's every Saturday where I reflect on these podcast episodes, as well as on books that I'm reading and quotes that I'm pondering. There's a link in the show notes where you can subscribe. I'd be grateful if you could sign up. And if you're watching this episode on YouTube, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel. Leave your thoughts in the comment section below. And also please do subscribe on your preferred podcast platform as well. My name is David Ansara. This is the Solutions Podcast. Until next week, take care.